for the keynote session, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Steve Hyman, Director of the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, who's going to talk to us about revitalizing translational psychiatry. Good morning. Good morning. So you've already heard in the last session some mention of the enormous toll taken by neuropsychiatric disorders. Just to remind you, they are the leading causes of disability worldwide and also contribute to premature mortality. There are, according to the WHO, something like 800,000 suicides in the world per year for which uh, depression, schizophrenia, and other psychiatric disorders are the major risk factors. And yet, because of the challenges of psychiatric disorders, therapies have really lagged. Uh, I have on the slide here a list of the major therapies used to treat uh, um, psychotic and mood disorders. Uh, I should say that there are no reliable pharmacologic therapies for the core symptoms of autism to date. But you'll see, you know, lithium we've been using since the 1960s, but it was first identified as a potential therapeutic agent by John Cade in 1949. The antipsychotic drugs were introduced as surgical pre-anesthetics uh, by the French surgeon Laborie in 1951. Uh, the antidepressants were discovered in the 1950s also by accident. Isoniazid was a chemical congener of, uh, uh, of the drug Ipraniazid. Isoniazid, of course, is used to treat tuberculosis. Ipraniazid um, didn't uh, impress the, microbac the mycobacteria, but lifted the mood of the patients in these uh, sanatoria and became the first MAOI and so forth. But the point is, now, well more than a half century later, we have no new molecular targets in wide use, and efficacy has absolutely stalled. Now, why is this? Well, first, um, there is a dearth of molecular insight with which to nominate new targets. We, we've been recycling many of the same hypotheses, sort of it's the refried serotonin syndrome for a long time. And part of that is because human brain tissue is uh, inaccessible. So uh, I have up there a, a cancer, a dividing cancer cell to remind us that while cancer is a hard problem, cancer surgeons do excisional biopsies and hand the disease to the scientist who can then study these cells, make cell lines, put them under the skin of nude mice and so forth. Whereas it is uh, vanishingly rare to get living human brain tissue. I mean, one can get a bit sometimes in epilepsy surgeries. What you see there is a uh, skull from uh, the uh, Inca period in Peru. Uh, the Incas uh, engaged in trephination to permit the uh, exit of uh, evil spirits, uh, the safety and efficacy data is no longer in existence, uh, but at any rate, obviously, we don't get uh, human brain tissue. And again, as you would have, you know already, but would have been amply clear from the last session, is even if we could get cells from a brain region, this is not going to answer our questions because the symptoms of uh, neuropsychiatric disorders are, are the results of activity in widely distributed circuits, and, uh, and, and we don't uh, as yet, even have a good census, we're waiting on the Allen and others, uh, of the cell types in, in, in humans and how they uh, connect with each other. The other thing is, um, there, is no, there, there aren't good disease models. Now, animal models, of course, are very useful mouse models for understanding basic underlying biological processes, and I'll show you an example later. But the, but claiming that there is an animal model of depression or schizophrenia is a bit far-fetched. Now, of course, uh, part of this has to do with, as we'll see, the polygenicity of common psychiatric disorders. Obviously, in cases of monogenic causes of intellectual disability and autism, like Rat Shank 3, uh, one can make informative uh, uh, mouse and other animal models. And we just saw what's really exciting is the ability now to um, make some of these models in primates. 
The other thing, finally, is that uh, we lack uh, biomarkers. And in most neuropsychiatric disorders, we're still dealing with descriptive uh, uh, diagnoses. And even as recently as the last decade, where there was a large number of failed clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease before the advent of PET agents that will allow you to visualize uh, um, amyloid and tau in the brain, it turns out that maybe as many as a third of the patients enrolled in those clinical trials uh, to test agents aimed at A-beta actually had Lewy body disease, so they didn't even have an amyloid disease. Uh, so you can imagine that when we do a depression clinical trial, a depression, a disease that has a lifetime risk across populations of about 15% with extraordinary heterogeneity, there's really little chance to, uh, to find new therapies without some sort, of, some sort of biomarker. Well, what we've always known in psychiatry, however, is that these diseases ran in families, and based on twin methodologies, it actually became apparent that autism, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, ADHD, are among the most heritable, common complex conditions afflicting humanity. Uh, but the trouble is that our brains are not like Mendel's peas. That is, uh, people still, unfortunately, have this shorthand of talking about a schizophrenia gene. But in fact, probably as much, maybe more than 5% of our genome is involved in risk of schizophrenia within any individual. We don't know how many, but certainly scores of variants influencing, slightly tipping the balance toward risk. Nonetheless, these very high heritabilities tell us that there are molecular clues to pathogenesis lurking in our genomes. The question was, how could we access them? And uh, people tried, but, uh, but um, with older technologies, it was simply not possible. And, uh, and of course, neuroscientists thought they had ideas about what might uh, contribute to these disorders. We went through what's up here, the dark ages of uh, complex trait genetics. There were all kinds of candidate gene studies, and there were linkage studies which, which were based on the assumption that there was a gene of large effect segregating in families, if not across populations. But what you can see is that while uh, for single gene Mendelian traits, by the year 2000, almost 100 uh, genes had been isolated, and now many, many more. And in uh, animal models and in plants, one began to have some success understanding po more polygenic situations, complex trait genetics. Uh, in humans, um, we, we, were, we were really getting nowhere. And this is not just in, in psychiatry. Uh, now, before I get on to uh, technological advances, I think there's something very important uh, to, 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 to grasp, which is that we should not actually expect highly penetrant alleles cause, to cause diseases like schizophrenia or autism. Why is this? Well, evolution actually is still working. Uh, a number of fecundity studies have been done in Scandinavia. This is one from Power et al. And basically, uh, just in the interest of time, if we focus here, a male with schizophrenia has a quarter as many offspring as their unaffected sibling. A male with autism has a quarter as many offspring as their unaffected siblings, and females have about half as many offspring. And what you can see is, uh, from this, you can actually do a calculation, which has been done by Mark Daly and Ben Neal, is that any allele which increases risk by more than 10% uh, is rapidly removed from the population. I mean, you, it's, a, it's a pretty simple calculation. And so the alleles that are transmitted and that become common in populations have to have an odds ratio of less than 1.1. Now, these very large monogenic forms of intellectual disability, autism, epilepsy that we have already heard about in the primate models very commonly occur de novo. That is, they occur for the first time in the proband, and they occur in genes that are constrained in evolution. You see fewer than expected mutations given the uh, size of the gene and its nucleotide sequence. And these are genes that don't tolerate haploinsufficiency. And these young people with autism and often severe int intellectual disability and other syndromal features tend really not to reproduce, so, so those genes tend not to be transmitted at all. So the transmitted genes in the population will be small. And that's why 
um, linkage failed, and of course candidate gene analysis failed because we had uh, delusional confidence almost that we could reverse engineer or figure out what was going on in the brain in schizophrenia or autism, and clearly we couldn't. So what's changed is not that we've gotten smarter, but technology. So uh, an inexpensive microarray, there's now a psych chip, but there's another generation uh, being uh, printed by Illumina. It's been designed by my colleague Ben Neal at the Broad. Um, and for about $50 US, um, you, you can you have 100 loci that you can test, including things nominated by the global you know, genetics community, uh, as well as a very good GWAS uh, background, and, and have a sense of the overall risk profile of an individual, and also discover, uh, if it's adequately powered, new associations. And then, of course, the cost of sequencing has come way down. At the Genome Project, the initial budget was $3 billion. That's not scalable. Um, the current real cost of sequencing uh, you know, in, in a production facility, certainly at the Broad, is about $1,600 per person for a whole genome and for, uh, for whole exomes, which have an enormous amount of information. It's 1.5% of the genome. The cost is something like $700. And so one can begin to uh, uh, develop uh, very large populations. Now, the other thing that this technology then entailed is something, again, you heard about in the last, se uh, the last uh, session. Given that we, we can only expect genes of small effect, the signal to noise is going to be terrible. And therefore, we need very, very large populations. And so um, among uh, at least a subset of the global community. Uh, there are still people with what I call the pharaoh model of science, which is they want to be buried with their data. But among um, people who actually want to solve the problem, there, there are beginning to be very large international consortia that are generating the kind of populations that are necessary to do the genetics. And so this, uh, some of you may know this, but in 2014, uh, one of these large consortia the uh, Psychiatric Genomics Consortium published a study of nearly 40,000 people with schizophrenia. This is with a gene chip. This is common variants, or GWAS, uh, and 113,000 controls, and found um, biological insights that is genome-wide significant loci uh, that numbered more than 100. But Again, these are, these are loci of small effect, and I'll, 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 for those of you who are not geneticists, I'll give this a little more color in a second. The, the typical locus increased risk by only 8%. Okay, so this is called the Manhattan plot because uh, these are supposed to be skyscrapers, and the conventional significance level is uh, uh, 5 times 10 to the minus 8th, but it's basically P less than 0.05 corrected for a million comparisons. Um, it's, one, one actually wants to have greater statistical certainty, uh, but in order to achieve this level, one needs these large populations. When there were only 10,000 cases, uh, essentially nothing was, was significant. And the other thing is we're still on the very steep part of the discovery curve. Uh, that is, this is unpublished, uh, but with 47,000 cases, there are now 128 genome-wide significant loci, uh, and, and, and these are increasing. Now, these are, I'm not going to get into the details of the technology, but these are uh, these are associations which are statistically significant, but they're only associations, and they represent loci. They still need to be fine mapped. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, in terms of findings that are immediately neurobiologically ac uh, actionable, that would be, say, an amino acid change in, in, a, in a, a protein coding gene. Um, uh, one had hoped to find uh, actionable, experimentally actionable genetic results from sequencing. And there are two, two forms, uh, two general designs. One is a trio design where you look at two unaffected parents and an affected offspring. And actually for autism, uh, this has been a very rich 
uh, vein to mine, and we've found, again, the kind of genes that I've referred to already, which are constrained in evolution. You see fewer than expected mutations, and when you see a mutation, you see, tend to see a severe phenotype. In schizophrenia, uh, the trios uh, are yielding much less. Schizophrenia seems to be really uh, fundamentally, with some exceptions, of course, fundamentally polygenic. And I'll come back to autism uh, in a second. Um, so for autism with a trio design, certain genes keep popping up as different groups do large enough studies. Uh, but it's important if your phenotypic screen is based on autism, you find these things. But if it's based on intellectual disability or certain forms of congenital epilepsy, you also find the same genes, which tells you that it's not so simple. And we like to call these autism genes because that's uh, the sexy thing these days. But these are really genes that, uh, when they are mutated, often these are truncations that cause haploinsufficiency. What you actually get is uh, really deranged brain development and the most penetrant phenotype is often intellectual disability. But genes that keep coming up include uh, Syngap, uh, which is uh, involved in, uh, in synapses, or SCN2A, which is a sodium channel. And uh, ARID1B has come up even in screens that are focused on uh, syndactyly, that is, people whose fingers are connected. They often also, once you've focused on that as your uh, initial trait, you also find intellectual disability. But th th this, this set of genes that you find in trio designs um, uh, is, is getting a lot of attention. And again, because these are penetrant mutations, people can make make uh, informative animal models. But when you do case control, what you find, what you learn in the end, is that rare variants are rare. That is, our genomes are peppered with uh, millions and millions of variants that alter uh, proteins. Uh, and uh, and uh, just because a gene is altered in this fashion, even if you already know by GWAS that it's in a locus that matters, proving causality uh, is a very, very difficult matter. And to date, with now about 15,000, uh, it says 6,000 here, but about 15,000 uh, sequences, um, there are lots of interesting mutations that could be associated with schizophrenia or autism or bipolar disorder. But we may run out of humans before we have statistical significance in many of these genes. And so we're going to have to find some way of doing biological experiments and looking for the alignment of outcomes along with, say, common variant analysis, which is better powered, uh, and being careful not to fool ourselves if we're going to put some of these, again, protein-changing variants to work in biological experiments. OK, now, many people. Uh, and I apologize because I know I've, uh, some of colleagues in the audience are neurologists, but many, many of my colleagues who are neurologists, who always feel sorry for psychiatrists, um, uh, and who have overlearned on uh, Huntington's disease and, and uh, rare forms of ALS, will say, you know, you poor souls, you have no uh, penetrant genes, you only have these polygenic disorders. Why do you care about uh, a uh, variant, a locus or a mutation that increases risk 8 or 10 percent? You know, you can't make an animal model. And it's true, it's going to be very hard to make an animal model, although I think eventually uh, with uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and its grandchildren and multiplexing, we'll be able to humanize rodents and perhaps marmosets at uh, you know, many loci, maybe 100 or more loci, and uh, perhaps have, in that sense, a sensitized screen, much easier to do in Drosophila, there's no question, but we have to create sensitized models. Nonetheless, the point of finding these alleles of small effect what, what matters is not the effect size, but that you are statistically confident of the association. If you're confident of the association, think of an allele, a risk allele, as a way of finding a gene. And genes are then a way of finding molecular pathways, protein complexes, and, uh, and, and biological mechanisms. But it's not so easy because uh, any particular gene may have very diverse functions uh, across different cell types in the brain and, of course, the rest of the body. And there's the problem of people 
you know, scanning this data, which is all public, and then looking up a gene on Wikipedia and saying, I know the function. And in fact, of course, um, that way uh, lies error. Uh, so one of the things, one, one of the tools for, for pinpointing the molecular mechanism or the cell type is if you have the entire genetic picture, it will tend to converge on you know, um, particular cells, particular biological processes. Uh, and, and so, um, uh, basically, the basic thesis is that we want to push unbiased large-scale genetics, so no hypotheses, uh, that to, to reveal new biology, and, and, and the, the notion across all biology, and just not, not only neuropsychiatric disorders, is that many hundreds of disease-associated genes are going to reduce to a far smaller number of pathways. And there's already some evidence that this is happening. And, and you can see, when you start doing single-cell RNA-seq, uh, that uh, risk alleles tend to be overexpressed in, say, one type of uh, inhibitory interneuron in the cortex and, and not another. Uh, but the idea is that we've got to finish the job and put the jigsaw puzzle together. And so just to give you an example, in schizophrenia, again, these are global collaborations. Um, uh, by 2018, we expect to have more than 100,000 people with schizophrenia, GWAST. Uh, autism is lagging, but we'll catch up uh, with the help of the Simons Foundation and others. 60,000 exome sequences and 20,000 whole genomes. These are very large numbers. These are estimates actually, depending on the cost of whole genome sequencing and data storage, the, the, the ratio may change. But these are the kinds of numbers that we can expect. Now, the other thing is that we and the whole world started with very convenient population registries in Northern Europe, uh, largely Scandinavia, and also from the National Health in Great Britain. Uh, so that first slide I showed you with, a, with 108 independent loci was 96% uh, European DNA, but that's only 16% of global uh, genetics. And so to really finish the job, we need to uh, 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 sample all of the world's uh, genetic diversity. And so we have begun a series of collaborations. We have one with the uh, uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Uh, I love it in Shanghai. They, a pilot is 30,000 people. Uh, um, they reminded me, I was just there, that they have the same population as Canada, just in somewhat more compact uh, land area. Uh, um, but hopefully this will be the beginning of a, of a very large population. I, I'm not going to go through all of this in the interest of time, but we've also begun in sub-Saharan Africa because that's where the greatest human genetic diversity is, and there are also global equity reasons to do this. But, but here we're trying to team up, team up with the Wellcome Trust and other British charities to develop uh, investigator training and to make sure that we're, we're, we're actually good, uh, good partners. Now, I'm going to end with one finding that was reported in Nature in February by my colleagues uh, Steve McCarroll uh, and uh, Beth Stevens. So the, 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 um, uh, what we've known about schizophrenia for a long time is that the uh, onset is not at the time when you recognize psychosis, hallucinations, and delusions, but what you have are kids who, in their mid to late teens, begin to lose cognitive function across many domains. And, and if you test people carefully and you have prior testing, you can see that these children will have lost more than a standard deviation in verbal fluency and working memory and other cognitive functions. And then they begin to develop what's called the ultra high risk syndrome. They begin to isolate themselves and become suspicious. They have attenuated psychotic symptoms. They think they hear th noises and then full-blown psychosis, although not everyone with this syndrome converts to psychosis. So the question always is, why this stereotypic age of onset in mid to late teens? The other findings uh, are that there are, you know, red is always bad in these uh, pseudo-color MRIs. There are many studies showing progressive thinning, especially of prefrontal and temporal cortex uh, that, again, is typical of schizophrenia. And by the time someone is psychotic, there is excess thinning already observed. And then there are these well-known post-mortem studies, although this literature is thin. There haven't been enough different labs doing this. But David Lewis has found that in compared to healthy, these are healthy dendrites, uh, people with schizophrenia, and he doesn't claim these are typical, but people with schizophrenia have fewer dendritic processes and many fewer dendritic spines, and therefore presumably synapses, 
which presumably undergirds this, uh, this uh, cortical loss. Now, this was the Manhattan plot, and there was one ultra-high tower, and that was in the MHC locus, the major histocompatibility locus. And my colleague, uh, Steve McCarroll, with an intrepid graduate student, took on this uh, nightmarish thicket of human recombination and found that this tower had actually three signals, but the biggest came from complement factor C4. You probably know complement from the, from the uh, peripheral immune system, where it opsonizes cells undergoing apoptosis or cells that are virally infected. Uh, uh, we wouldn't have known what to do with this, except that Beth Stevens, when she was a postdoc with Ben Barris, and she's now with us in Boston, had done a done a unbiased screen looking for uh, the eat me signal in normal synaptic pruning, that is, in the processes of selection that removes inefficient and weak synapses and maintains strong ones. And lo and behold, the complement system was the key activator. And I won't take you through this diagram because I see uh, I'm already approaching, I'm, I'm about to reach my sell-by date. Um, but um, but the, the bottom line is that um, in, uh, in complement C4 knockout mice, uh, Beth could show that the, this is pruning in the visual system. There was a certain amount of uh, synaptic pruning. And remember, this is how this is, we saw Hubel and Weasel already up on, if here in an earlier talk. This is how you end up having binocular vision, uh, proper segregation of eye inputs. In the heterozygote, there's less pruning, and in the uh, uh, homozygote knockout, uh, even less. And right now, Mike Carroll, an immunologist collaborator who has long worked on complement, has made different overexpressors, so we'll be able to see these. Now, again, these are using rodents in a great way to look at fundamental biological processes. We're not making rodents with schizophrenia, right? That's, that's what's really important. Uh, but the bottom line is, uh, you know, is that we can uh, now begin to do a lot of biology, but more than that, we have collaborations with clinical groups, uh, a very important one with Pat McGorry and the University of Melbourne, where we're trying to get serial CSF collections to look at complement and also do unbiased proteomics to see what bits of synapses have been pooped out by the microglia that have eaten the synapses. Uh, to try to get uh, biomarkers, and we're working on better. There are PET ligands for microglia, but we, we're trying to create, uh, our, our chemists uh, working together at MIT and Mass General are trying to get more specific PET ligands for activated microglia. So this is an example of how you take even a GWAS analysis that gives you a locus, you can fine map it, and it points you to a biological process, and this, in this case, the process of synaptic pruning, there's a long way to go. I don't want to overclaim. But what's exciting is that synaptic pruning could explain the age of onset. Mid-teens is when temporal and prefrontal cortex are pruned. It could explain the loss of dendrites and synaptic spines seen post-mortem, and it could explain uh, the cortical thinning. We'll see, but, uh, but for the first time, this kind of global, unbiased, large-scale genetics is creating clues to new biology that should reignite the ability to think about disease mechanisms and therefore biomarkers and therapeutics so that we don't end up giving patients 1950s drugs in the 21st century. Thank you. Simon, thank you very much. It's not a sell-by date. We just want to ask yeah. you lots of questions. Yeah, so yeah. if you can find your way to the seats, thank you very much. And I'm loving the idea of a 30,000-person pilot. Um, I'm now going to introduce Professor Monica De Luca. Reintroduce. She was here, of course, yesterday. Professor of Pharmacology at the University of Milan and President of FENS, uh, who's going to lead the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Steve, for this excellent presentation. It was extremely inspiring to me. I'm not a genetist, as you know, but I'm a synaptic biologist, and I was very happy to see the CNEPs recurrently coming on the system. Well, I'm not a geneticist either. I'm a <laughs> consumer of genetics. <laughs> okay. And the brute in a brute force machine. Okay. <laughs> well, I, I would like to be very short, and I, I think that we have to thank you primarily for two aspects that are very general in science. As you mentioned today, one of the key aspects is uh, uh, confronting ourselves with major challenges, and certainly this is a major challenge, and this is also impacting a lot on the societal challenge, because if we look only in Europe, I'm a little yes, bit yeah. European biased, the cost of these diseases that you 
UNHCR study in community is one quarter of the total cost of brain yes. diseases in yes. Europe, which is a huge amount of money. And this means that yes. we are not there yet, as I said yesterday. And the second point is a general point of cooperation. And particularly, not only because we have really to cooperate, as we learned in the previous session, but instructing us on the power of numbers, which is crucial, is we really would like to learn something. Yes. So we have two short questions. Okay. First of all, you said that many times, if you are following these rare alleles, you know, it's very important because you, then you jump in a common mechanism on a common pathway. And I was curious and asking whether this is true within the same disease or even cross diseases. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I had more time, I would have shown you that um, uh, 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 that, that the, the whole psychiatric classification is wrong. People, I mean, and again, this is not to blame people. There was no information. No, that's right. But if you take symptoms as your only way of classifying, and then you, then you make the intellectual error, and this is not forgivable, of creating rigid silos, and you say there is, you know, schizophrenia, and there is something made up called schizoaffective disorder, uh, nature doesn't agree. And so what you see is that there is a gradient of shared risk alleles across all of the psychotic disorders. Yeah. And among common alleles, there's 60% sharing uh, between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Now, they're different in the extremes. Someone with classic bipolar disorder responds to lithium, someone with schizophrenia doesn't, but there's a lot of sharing. And then interestingly, there is uh, another 20% of sharing between schizophrenia and autism, autism yeah. but they're not the same ones that schizophrenia shares with bipolar disorder. So there, there's a really interesting set of conundra to work out. Will this lead us to uh, categorize better our patient? Because, of course, we know that all these uh, yeah. diseases are heterogeneous diseases, right, but right. maybe in a second step. Yes. I think what we're going to end up with, it's, it's, uh, it's early days, but we can already see it, uh, is that um, there, there's going to be no bright line. It's not like um, if you take something like depression, which is harder to study because it's less heritable and more, even more heterogeneous, but there's no bright line. It's not like you have one more symptom and you weren't depressed and now you're depressed. It's more like blood pressure or type 2 diabetes. There's a continuum or dimension. And uh, once we recognize that psychiatric disorders are, are dimensional uh, differ from normality really only by degree, then we can begin to rationally set thresholds for, uh, for treatment, the way we do in hypertension at different blood pressures. Yeah, Your doctor right. will say, uh, exercise and eat less salt at, a, at another threshold. They'll give you some drugs and so forth. Um, the other thing, the sharing, so there, there's, there's a continuity with health, but then there's also sharing across uh, disorders. So the DSM-5, uh, five, uh, divides up the anxiety disorders into lots of separate categories, and then people often end up with five diagnoses, and it's called comorbidity. Absolutely. Well, they have one underlying process, and so there's also a spectrum. And again, most human disease is like this. Yeah, this is a case, for example, yeah. in dementia. They yeah, found yeah. this, what they yeah. call the Lot. continuous in dementia, in which common genes and common yes. mutation has been found, but in a sort of a degree, you know, yes. Yes. in a certain yes. degree. Yes. Is this meaning that we will going to get, in, in the long run, important targets that will be sort of pillar targets for the therapeutic? Well, you know, um, there's, a, there's one scenario, and of course, since we know so little, I can speculate shamelessly, but, you know, in cancer, um, tissue of origin, of course, remains important to surgeons and radiation therapists, but for medical oncology, what matters are the, um, uh, the precise mutations that make up uh, the cancer. And it may very well be that in the much longer run, what will matter will be, you know, there will be symptomatic treatments, clearly, but what will matter maybe if we have disease course altering treatments, and this may be true for neurodegeneration as well, yeah, we'll, we'll have treatments find. targeted at your major uh, yeah. causal yeah. Uh, mechanisms. Yeah. And as a last comment, and then maybe I leave it to the audience if there is time, but I think that we should not forget the importance of learning more into biological mechanism yes. and general biological mechanism right. and fundamental research. I mean, this is feeding up back to the fundamental knowledge of the system. Right. I can't stress enough the importance of basic science, and policymakers somehow think we already yeah. know enough. But 
This is not the case. In, if, if Steve McCarroll had found this C4 association in 2005, we would have been scratching our heads. In 2006, because of basic investigation into the mechanisms of uh, synaptic plasticity and yeah. refinement and pruning, uh, all of a sudden, we knew that the complement system was important. Very important. And then the great thing, I'm so fortunate to be in the, this Boston-Cambridge community because when Steve did a literature search, it found out that Beth Stevens was, a, was you know, Just 500 meters away. <laughs> next uh, door, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, I, I also stressed the yeah. importance of basic science yesterday. I wonder whether the audience would like to uh, ask some questions. Maybe we have a few minutes for that. And I think that with the, such an inspiring lecture, maybe this is a good chance to challenge a bit our keynote speaker. Questions? Yes, I, I can't see much. I, oh, Hi. there, yes. Hi, Steve. This is uh, yeah. Julio from Australia. So I had a question about um, the issue of uh, rare variants and like people have individual you know, pathways towards these diseases versus things that can be found in GWAS because they are shared by large numbers of people. Yeah, so what we're finding with rare variants is, I'll take an example of a, of a gene and a protein that's very interesting to us. It's a gene called CACNA1i. It encodes a T-channel, CAV3.3, and it's interesting because it's most highly expressed in the thalamic reticular nucleus where it controls, uh, among other things, sleep spindles in stage two sleep, and lo and behold, it's been known for some years, people with schizophrenia have abnormal sleep spindles. Uh, so we have some collaborations that way, but when we look then in the protein coding region of that gene, what we see are scores of rare variants, uh, many of them ultra rare, some private. And we are you know, making cellular models, we've made some knock-in mice with these rare variants, but we still statistically have the problem of knowing for sure that this really interesting rare variant we find in this gene, in this person who has schizophrenia, is really on the causal pathway, uh, and, uh, and that isn't worked out. But, uh, but this, that, that's part of the reason to, for these enormous numbers that we're looking for, is to be able to find you know, stronger uh, associations. Another one. So Steve, thanks very much. David Menon from Cambridge. Yeah. So um, I was listening to your um, concept that we take all these hits and bring them together to a smaller number of pathways, which we know are important. But both Ben Neal and uh, Jonathan have repeatedly whipped me for having preconceptions when we go to large data sets. Yes. How do we statistically make the yes. process of yes. making it rigorous yes. rather than putting too many right. priors on it? Well, Ben, you know, I mean, so, uh, you know, if any, if right now what people are doing is they are using biased um, uh, aggregations such, such as Go categories, which, you know, people say, you know, these, this is the synaptic data set, this is uh, something that's called an ARC data set, which, you know, Lord knows. Um, and uh, these are just biased, Th these are things, you know, two neuroscientists went out, they had lunch, and they made a list. Um, uh, ultimately, what we have to do as a community and, and we've, we've, we've actually, we're funding some collaborations, m many of them actually in the, in the Netherlands, um, uh, to improve these uh, synaptic gene ontology categories, but ultimately we have to just do a lot better about understanding, you know, which, which proteins come together in which cells that get marked by autism risk or schizophrenia risk. Uh, and again, that, that uh, that kind of information is going to come partly from what we heard from Christoph about what the Allen is doing, you know, knowing which genes are expressed in which cell types. Yeah. But it, it's ultimately an empirical and experimental matter, and we shouldn't get too excited by these sort of made-up gene clusters uh, that we have in 2016. Hmm. Thank you. So are there other questions from the audience? Okay. There is... No, we have, we, we, there's a line, is that? There, there was a hand raising over there. Yeah. Maybe if it is short, we can take it. It's gonna be a very short question, I know, and a short answer. 
Sure, I'll make it short. Um, <laughs> Thank um, you. Ali, I'm an MD, PhD. Um, so what we increasingly see in neurological disorders is a clinical and pathological correlation. And you actually confirm the diagnosis only after you've seen the stainings. Do you see a scope of that in psychiatric illnesses? Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, it's not going to be, I mean, it's true and it's not true in neurology. I mean, there are many epilepsies, for example, where, you know, the neuropathologist isn't going to make the diagnosis. It's going to be molecular. And I think for psychiatry, again, most, of, right, I, I, it's possible. Uh, but I think uh, right now diagnoses will be, remember, the genetics is only going to be probabilistic, right? It's never going That's to right. be certain. So I think it will be the combination of a gene chip with some neurobiological test, which could be the measure of some metabolites in CSF. It could be some neurophysiological tests or neuroimaging. And maybe one day, you know, the old H&E stain, obviously improved with antibodies. Uh, but, but I think neurology and psychiatry in that sense are going to uh, converge. Thank you very much indeed for that question. Uh, any closing remarks from you, Professor Delaney? No, I'm so happy that we had this fantastic discussion. I think it was really impressive and instructive for me. Thank you, Steve. Good. Okay. Indeed so. Uh, Professor Hyman, Professor DeLuca, thank you both very much indeed.